Welcome to our look at the Veil Dancer Hero Pack for Aventuria, featuring a new hero and a short 18 plus adventure. Thanks to Ulysses Spiel for sending us a copy of this expansion to check out. All right, so the Adventuria Adventure Card Game was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Sack, and this still uses that same system. Now, the short adventure in this expansion was written by Christian Lonsing, and the entire thing was localized to English under the eye of Timothy Brown. Artwork is from Verena Biscop, Jamila Knopf, Christopher Kraus, Julia Metzger, Nikolai Osterog, and Mia Steinberg, Steingraber. Now, the English version of this expansion was published by Ulysses Spiel in 2020 after being part of a successful Kickstarter project, but due to global shipping issues, still is not available in stores. So supposedly copies are out there. We managed to get one as a preview, but you still can't get this at your local store. And unfortunately, I can't tell you when you will be able to. I think you can pre-order it online now, but that's it. Now, this hero pack is an expansion for the Adventure Adventure card game, which is required to use all of the contents of this box. This is not a standalone adventure. For more information on Aventuria, check out our reviews on the blog, YouTube, and the podcast. The Veil Dancer Hero Pack contains a new hero, Karima Al Jamila, a Novati Starazai. This character can be used both for the competitive dual mode of Aventuria as well as for cooperative campaign play. Now, speaking of campaign play, this box also contains a short one act adventure titled Orgy of Thorns which is designed to be played using the new hero and up to five other adventurers, though it actually requires at least two others we learned while playing. Now, this adventure is aimed at adult players and may contain erotic euphemisms, is how it is worded in the book. For a look at the components you get in this box, making sure not to spoil the story at all, check out our Safe for Work unboxing video of the Veil Dancer Hero set on YouTube. Now, as far as quality goes, the cards and everything matches the quality of the base game, which is extremely important for an adventure card game. They nailed it. Um, it includes both a full deck for Karima, a reference card explaining her unique card type, which are dances, and all the cards needed to play through Orgy of Thorns. There's also a small 14-page booklet that has the adventure text, as well as a two-page character background for your new Novati Sharazad. So nothing one wouldn't expect from any Aventuria expansion, really. Yeah, this is the second of the hero packs we've opened up. Um, the first one being uh, the Alchemist. Oh, no, this was the first one we opened, actually. Sorry. We opened this one, but another one we've opened up, and they all seem to have the same thing. So you get a new character and a short story. Now, note, this expansion is for the second printing of Aventuria, though compatible with first. So it uses cards to track health. So there's no life wheel. Nor is there one for this character included in the Wheel of Life expansion, which we've reviewed in the past. Oddly, there is also no character token in the box. So you are going to have to substitute another character token or find some other randomization method when playing. Because you do use that when you're randomizing dam damage or to see whose turn, who acts as first player. Yeah, the health is easy enough, but the token is a pain. It would have been nice to have standardized these a little better. But let's start with this new hero. Karima Al-Jamila is a Novari Sharasad, the last surviving member of the seven Ahmad Sumi, trained by the swordmaster Rashdul on a quest to rescue her mother from the clutches of the Lord of Vengeance. She's a master of the Novari tradition of the Rakisa and the nine dances of Rastula. So this is all represented by a hero deck featuring a brand new card type and mechanic, dances. Karima's deck contains a number of dance cards, oddly only six, not nine, given the background, each of which are permanent cards that, when played, get three tokens on them. At the end of each round, a token is removed from all dances that are in play, and once the last token is removed from a dance, it goes in your discard pile. Now, along with this, Karima's special ability it can be used once per game, is to add one token to each in-play dance. And she also has some non-permanent cards that can also add tokens. Now, each dance has a different in-game effect, including things like increasing her damage, giving her defense, improving her chance to hit, giving her a better dodge chance, distracting enemies, 
excuse me, and distracting enemies by adding to their roles when they act on the villain turn. With this, she also has a number of equipment cards that work better once she has at least two dances in place. So you're always encouraged to have at least two going. While she doesn't have as much armor, he does, though, have the highest dodge rating in the entire game. Uh, this includes some sets we haven't opened. I verified that one online. This is the highest dodge you get with a nine um, with cards and equipment that can make it even higher than nine. So more than a by the time you get her built up, it's a more than a 50% chance she will dodge any attack. Which is not a big shock to see a dancer have a high agility. It's pretty thematic. Now, despite coming with an 18 plus adventure, there's nothing that would make this hero and her deck and the cards in it not safe for work. Now, there's definitely nothing erotic and there's not even any euphemisms here, which I think is good because this means you can easily add this character to the rest of your adventurous stuff and use it in other games without having to worry about the age of the players who may be playing her or with her. Indeed, while some of the art might be considered vaguely suggestive, it's still less suggestive than, for instance, many TV commercials during a U.S. sports ball game. Fair enough. Now, as for thoughts on how she plays, stay tuned to the later part of this review, where I'll be sharing my thoughts after summarizing what you get in the expansion and how to play. Well, now that we know about our new hero, how about you tell us a bit about the included adventure without spoiling anything and keeping things safe for work? Well, the included adventure is called Orgy of Thorns. So much for safe for work. <laughs> Again, just suggested. Uh, it's meant to be for adults only and for pretty good reason. While there's no nudity or sexual acts depicted on the cards, the henchmen do feature some suggestive artwork, and you will find a similar piece of artwork in the adventure itself. There's just the one. Now, despite being a single act, this adventure includes not one, but two combats, with featuring some very cool and interesting use of the game mechanics to tie those two combats together. As we've been finding with all of the adventure expansions, this is awesome to see because I love seeing what they've done to make every combat and story feel different. I'm always surprised when I try something new for adventure and I'm like, because like the whole game could just be sit down, fight a combat, sit down, fight a combat. And the things they've done to add variety have really impressed me. So not your uh, kid's adventure, but still yet another enjoyable and exciting adventure? I would say yes. So I'll get into my details with some issues I did have with it. Now, as for this whole adult thing, the content here is both erotic and violent. Now, the name Orgy of Thorns should have probably given me a bit of a hint with that. This is definitely an orgy of flesh and blood. Uh, the story refers to it specifically as an orgy of violence to seal a pact with the Mistress of Bloody Ecstasy. And while the book states there are erotic euphemisms, they're pretty dang blatant, like the well-endowed swordsman whose main attack is to show you his saber. What I wouldn't call this adventure at all is titillating. And it's got a lot of male power fantasy vibe out of the story, which some people probably won't enjoy. Now, the most important thing to note here, though, for anyone thinking of playing this adventure is that there is a complete lack of player agency in regards to what happens to your characters in this adventure. And that's going to be a no-go for some players, and I fully understand. Now, I get it. This isn't a role-playing game. This is a card game that has a very linear story structure that goes from point A to point B to point C. And the lack of choice and decision points, to be honest, is something we've had in all adventure area modules. They're not which way books. But what happens to your characters here is completely non-consensual. Due to this, I strongly suggest talking about this and getting everyone at the table to agree to be part of that, knowing that the story may take them places that they wouldn't want to go with their characters. You may even want to go so far as to have someone pre-read the adventure so you can bring up specific parts you might want to veil during play. It's a bit frustrating that the box wasn't clearer with its content warnings. Yeah. This seems to contain some really problematic content for some people completely removed from the innuendo and titillation that it seemed like we were getting. Yeah, it just wasn't at all what we expected. And that could have been definitely put more clear. Now, one final note on the adventure. The pirate, despite it saying that it's for Karima and up to five other heroes, there is a part in the adventurer 
where it has two heroes, specifically not Karima, who have to make a test. And well, unless you're playing with at least three players total, you're not going to have these two other characters. So three to six players, or you're going to be in trouble then. In a way. Now, I'll admit when we played, we only played two players and we just kind of went with it. The one player made that test. But story-wise, it didn't quite work, though we kind of made it work in our own headcanon. Now, once you are completed this erotic adventure, or if you choose not to play the erotic, erotic adventure at all, which honestly is a very valid choice, you do get a new set of adult-themed henchmen cards that you could now add to the rest of your Aventuria stuff and potentially have them come up in future games. The way you build a henchman deck every game is you look through all your cards you own and pull out the ones with certain keywords. Well, all of these henchmen have the human and guard keywords, and both of those are pretty common in Aventuria combats that I've seen. Now, the deck also does include one mage, which I thought was cool, but every single one of these new henchmen have the Belkello keyword, which is the demon god of pleasure or whatever that's being worshipped in this adventure. And the included adventure calls for you to use every guard you have that has the Belkello keyword, which means you use the entire deck from this set and none of the stuff that had come out previous to this. So it makes sure you get these adult themed henchmen in play for this adventure. The other thing that's worth noting is there's no new other story cards. So sometimes you get events or demon abilities or summon cards or what players are going to be more interested in reward cards. There's none of that in here. Now to make up for the lack of rewards, this adventure, which is only a short one act adventure is actually worth two XP instead of the usual one. Well, it's nice that they gave that little extra kick rather than just ignoring the lack of re rewards. Yes. Well, now that we know what we're getting in this box and some idea of what to expect from the adventure, how mm -hmm. about you share your thoughts on this Aventuria expansion? Okay, so Deanna and I broke this out on, on a date night, game night. Uh, we expected this to be something fun to play. We'd play a lot of games together. And we were kind of hoping, like it's Veil Dancer, it says it's 18 plus to actually be a little titillating. Uh, we were looking to possibly add some excitement to the night, right? And straight up, no, uh, the, that was not a good choice of game with that goal in mind. Um, we will just say that it probably um, did the opposite effect <laughs> of, of what we were hoping it would attend. But before I get into why, I want to start with some of the good bits, though. And we'll talk, start by talking about the, uh, the character, the, the new character you get with this pack. So Deanna took on the role of Karima Al-Jamila, and I played my personal favorite Aventuria character so far, which is Arbosh the Dwarf Blacksmith. Now, Deanna found Karima pretty easy to play, picked up how the deck worked quickly enough, and really enjoyed the new dance mechanic. Like every Aventuria character, it did take a bit to build up a tableau of dances and talents and equipment, but once she did, the deck just had a very solid flow to it with various dances coming into play and going well and get going away and being replaced by other ones. And then the ability to combo different dances for different effects was very cool. And the character proved to be very effective, especially in this particular adventure with a number of abilities that caused the enemy to add to their die rolls, which was particularly important in this case. Now, the one thing I did notice that Karima doesn't seem to be very interactive doesn't seem to work well with the other characters. There weren't a lot of abilities that you played that affected other players, like having them draw cards or get health or anything like that. They seem very centered on this character alone. Overall, Deanna really enjoyed playing this character. And honestly, there's a really good chance it may become her new favorite. After trying her in a few more adventures, she's only played the character once. But right now she's ranked second under Carolyn Calavanti, the half-elf rogue, which is her current favorite character. Well, great that she'll have someone to play when I steal the rogue from her when I'm down. <laughs> now, as for the adventure, I don't even know where to start. So let's start with the positive. Let's stick to positive. Mechanically, this was the best adventure adventure we played thus far. Out of all the adventures in the core box, the poltergeist and what we played through in Forest of No Return. It did some very different and cool things with the mechanics of the game where you play through one combat and once it's over, you leave most of everything set up. You, you leave your tableaus in play. Some of the stuff clears, but a bunch of it stays. You then continue the story 
making um there's one particular check scene where you could technically lose the game if you rolled enough critical failures in a row and then start a new combat with everything still out from the first one which was fascinating so interesting so i'm not sure about uh being able to lose the game on a check but it's nice to see that they're still able to bring new ideas to the table and keep the mechanics of the game new and interesting. Thankfully, it's not one die roll for the lose the game, but I actually, to be honest, I appreciate it because it was nice to have a way to lose that wasn't in combat to see that they've expanded it that way. So the stuff between combats isn't just gain a fate point or lose it. So I thought that was kind of neat. And, then, and honestly, it's one of those, if you fail, another character can try. Plus, you can also just choose to lose health to re-roll. So you would have to roll an awful lot of 20s to actually fail out at this point, but it is definitely possible. Now, what I loved about this is that it changed one of the things I don't like about Aventuria, which is that you reset to zero between fights. I always found that thematically made no sense. Why would my character escape from the guards, go out into the woods and take all their armor off and forget all their skills and then have to start over when the wolves attack? I always thought that was silly. So I love the way things carried over from combat to combat. I was also very happy to see a one act short adventure feature two fights because I was totally expecting make one or two checks, have a fight and be done. And it was really fascinating to play a fight where at the start, you're buffed, you're ready, you're all equipped, you're good to go. All your cards are in play. That was actually a lot of fun. Now, along with this, the mechanics for the henchmen were interesting and thematic, uh, amusing in a way. Every single one of them has their highest result, which in most adventure henchmen is either do nothing or run away. Instead, said that in a way they got really into what was going on and lost a ton of health, usually 2d6, but were so into it they kept going. So it was this whole aspect of losing yourself which is the entire part of the story and what the people who worship this god do is they lose themselves in the moment. I thought that was really neat because with this, it was possible for henchmen to keep rolling this result and just do a ton of damage to themselves. Now, to compensate for this, all of these new henchmen start with more than 20 health. When you're used to fighting three health bats, seeing a 26 health guard come out and only have a threat rating of four, you're kind of like, whoa, until you see this effect in play. Now, this is where Karima's ability to affect enemy die rolls and make them higher made her so powerful in these fights. Interesting, because as though although it's a powerful ability, regardless, doing damage with that mechanic is so far unique to this adventure set. Yeah, I haven't seen anything else that has high numbers like that. But her thing's gonna be great when you're doing that thing where you're fighting henchmen and if the boss is already dead, they run away. Like it's just a really neat mechanic all ability that's different from all the other characters. Now, a potential issue here is putting these henchmen in with the rest of your cards. Well, this whole pushing themselves beyond and going and losing themselves fit really well for this particular adventure, right? You're in an orgy as it's going on. I'm not sure if having a mounting mistress show up with the town guard when trying to escape town and having her exhaust herself during the resulting combat might seem a little odd and off theme at the time. So due to this, I think you're going to have to make a call whether or not to include these cards or not when playing other cooperative adventures. Like personally, what I figure I'm doing is I put them in the deck and if they come up, I'm going to look at the tone of the adventure we're doing and what's happening and decide if we keep it or not or just throw it to the bottom of the pile. Indeed, sometimes the theme doesn't matter quite as much and you're just bashing some interesting hench folk. But now, how about we move on to the problematic parts of this mm -hmm. adventure? Now, I'm going to add a content warning here. Some of the next part specifically deals with descriptions of BDSM and a lack of control that some might understandably be not comfortable with. Yes, very fair and fair warning. So first off, as I already mentioned, there is a serious lack of agency in this adventure. Regardless of whether you win or lose the first fight, your character is seduced and forced to act according to a vampire's will. Now, the language here is particularly cringy with Karmia, Karima, sorry, Karima being referred to as a mare that needs to be broken. Now, at this point, I'm not going to spoil it, but I feel I need to kind of quote this to kind of get across the language and tone of this. So feel free to skip ahead 30 seconds if you don't want, uh, maybe a little more than 30 seconds, uh, however long it takes me to read this, um, if you want to hear it. So 
Thus, another Novati has fallen into my hands. I already broke her sister, and now it is her turn. When I put the reins on her, she rears up. She is powerful and passionate, and I want to keep her that way. But I must still chastise her to keep her compliant. With her sister, I proceeded gently so as to not break her. However, over the course of her training, I came to know and appreciate the strength and endurance of her bloodline. Therefore, I take less care now with the new mare and rear her with a hard hand. Sometimes I use the whip until a gentle touch is enough to trigger voluptuous excitement and shy submission. Now, if I were reading a novel about a demonic presence, that would be one thing. But this is a game referring to one of the characters being played by the mm -hmm. group. This isn't just some NPC you failed to save. This is describing someone at the table as well. Right. That is the problem here is most people playing adventure are going to have some ownership and tied to the character they're playing. Right. They are going to care what happens to that player. And you have no choice but to sit through this. Then there's another section later on where characters are forced to bring forth the rows together through the use of body control. This is the part where you need at least three players, and the adventure basically forces the other players to have sex with each other in order to progress the plot. And you can actually lose the game by failing at it. All of this is written from the perspective of the vampire, which would be an interesting touch for storytelling reasons. Like, this is totally different. Every other story is like, historically, these heroes went and had an adventure. But reading it from the perspective of the vampire who got to sleep with the two sisters just feels like a right male power fantasy. Now, along with this, the story doesn't even fit the background. Like, Karima's background story is she's looking for her lost mother, but this adventure implies she's searching for her sister, who's become part of this cult. There's nothing about the mother in here or the, the Lord of Vengeance. It's some other god. And the whole bridging combat mechanic was awesome to play, but the way it works in the story doesn't really fit because they're two separate instances that happen with time passing. Like, it just didn't quite work. And then there's also the fact that this really isn't that erotic. Um, it's, I don't know, it almost feels like high school giggles more than anything else, right? And I, I should have realized with Orgy of Thorns that it was more of an orgy of pleasure and pain and with more slaughter along with the sex. Like, I just, I expected an 18 plus adventure to be suggestive and perhaps titillating, but it wasn't that at all. It was kind of gross and somewhat shameful. Yeah, this is really much more of a BDSM fantasy romp with demons than any sort of Arabian Nights Shahrazad adventure, as one might guess by looking at the box, which is really what it Im implies. Totally agree. Now, ignoring the ridiculously cringeworthy story, we did end up having a lot of fun telling our own version of the story while playing um, with Deanna's veil dancer doing her dances and removing veils and either distracting or exhausting the guards. Uh, my dwarf spent the entire adventure trying to get dressed as quickly as possible and get the heck out of there. Um, this happened organically because I could not draw a weapon card to save my life and drew every one of my armor cards in order. So it was put the boots on, okay, put the pants on, okay, put the helmet on, put that's what I did for the first half of the game. Now, eventually our boss reached a point where he couldn't take it anymore and started smashing heads and then things wrapped up pretty quickly. Um, but there was other story elements, like I ended up in a pretty personal vendetta with a serpent, certain whip-wielding henchman that ended up being really difficult to finish off who then came back in the second adventure. So we ended up telling a pretty good story out of it, but we were pretty much doing our own headcanon and ignoring what we were told was happening. First, those resilient henchmen. So overall, we had a lot of fun playing this adventure despite its ridiculous story. Mechanically, it was awesome. This was actually the best adventure adventure I played. The two linked combats were a ton of fun. The new henchmen actually being end up being pretty interesting and entertaining. Like despite being silly and saying things like they show you their sword, uh, the actual mechanics for what they were doing was kind of cool. And I actually really like the they lose themselves and take damage mechanic. It fit really well. And the twist between the two combats was awesome. I shared with Sean what it was, and I thought it was really neat because I'd never seen anything like that. I don't want to spoil it here. I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. The new character is solid. 
as I said, Deanna, this this could be her new favorite, and I look forward to seeing how Karima fares in other adventures. As for the new henchmen, they were great for this adventure, but I'm not sure. You're going to have to make a call whether you want to use them in future adventures or not. So luckily, leaving them in or taking them out all as one or individually is completely yeah. viable either way, thanks to this flexible system. Yeah, when you build a Hexman deck, it's up to you what henchmen to include. You're just limited by keywords. You don't have to put any of these in. As for who should possibly pick up this adventure, if you enjoy Aventuria, I strongly pit suggest picking this up. This is a great new character. Pick it up just to get Karima Aljamil. She's a very solid character, can be a ton of fun to play. She has a lot of great dueling cards, great for competitive play and played very well during a cooperative adventure. The new dance mechanic is interesting and fun, and makes for a deck that flows in interesting ways, which again just fits the theme. Now along with this great character, you get some other stuff that you may or may not want to use. The biggest question would be whether or not your group would enjoy the included short adventure. Mechanically, it's solid. By far the best adventure we played, but it's rife with problematic content and lack of player agency and that's not going to be for everyone. I strongly suggest someone in your group read through the adventure first, then make sure everyone is on board before playing. And even with this, you may want to self-edit the adventure, skipping over some of the more juvenile content. Well, that's it for our review of the Veil Dancer Hero set for the Aventuria Adventure Card Game. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review of this game over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. 